there. Are you ready to love again? Or do you feel like maybe it's not safe to love again? Do you trust yourself? Are you confused about how you won't catch another narcissist if you go out to date again? Today, I've got a very special guest. Gary Sellier is going to tell us how to feel safe to love again. His book is an amazing book about how to release the pain of past relationships and create the love you deserve. And in our conversation, we're going to give you some really good tips on how to break the patterns of dating a narcissist, being with a narcissist, and how to find the things that you want in your life and how to know and understand and recognize the feelings that you want from this person that's going to come into your life. My name is Tracy Malone, and I am the founder of NarcissisticAbuseSupport.com, and I am a coach, and I am here to help you. So let's listen to Gary and see what he's got to say and see if he can make you feel safe to love again. Let's get started. Welcome, Gary. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me, Tracy. It is, I've just been looking forward to this for a few weeks. Well, I am so happy that you're here because my survivors really need you. And before we get into this, I really would love it if you would just do a little intro and tell us a little bit about yourself so that they knew who's on the stage with me here. Sure. You know, I, I consider myself, I call myself a transformational relationship mentor. Transformation meaning I help neurons make better friends. It's not just coaching. It's not just advice. It's actually transforming the relationship and then mentor because it's skills. It's everything, you know. And the thing to know about me was, you know, I grew up with a borderline mother. That's that's the next house over from narcissistic personality disorder, right? <laughs> so I understand what personality disorder means. It's way different than having a few problems. You know, it's a different animal. <laughs> and twice divorced. I swore I'd never be divorced coming out of that. And, you know, I had to find my way back. And the day came when after... I had a series of painful breakups after the second divorce where I simply said, if, if after all these years of therapy, if I'm still choosing or creating the same thing, uh, then I'll crack the code. And that's been my life's work ever since. And it's culminating in my book, Safe to Love Again and what I'm doing now. So that's who I am, just a traveler and through time and space. <laughs> a traveler that helps people make it safe to love again exactly. um, and i was reading the, the subtitle how to release the pain of past relationships and create the love that you desire so as we look at my audience who are victims of narcissistic abuse and um they have had their trust broken they have been abandoned they've been broken they are they, they have no self-trust how does someone like that like start to learn to love again and, and trust and to feel safe about it. Yeah. You know, whatever set us up to have a narcissistic right, I mean, a partner, right? Underneath, there was something about that that felt familiar. Uh, you know, it felt uh, safe is not the word, but it felt survivable because we've got some sort of experience. Now, if narcissists can fool you, we've all been, how many of us have ever been fooled by a narcissist? Raise your hand. Okay, those of you who are not, then, you know, you're fitting. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> you know, you know, uh, they're good at it. They're really good at it, right? And the thing is, is to go back and realize that whatever missing feeling that you had probably growing up or maybe in an earlier relationship, it made it so you didn't have a right to have that feeling again. And if we can give you back the right to have that feeling, whether it's welcomed or worthy or, or cherished and empowered, mm -hmm. so then, you, then when you have a right to, you won't pick someone like that. Because if you feel unworthy, you'll find someone who's a taker. And narcissists are as good as that. Other people are too. There, you can find takers that aren't narcissists, but narcissists are the ultimate takers in life. Yeah. If you didn't feel empowered, you know, you, that makes you bait for the the ultimate narcissistic head head trip, mm -hmm. where you are constantly second guessing yourself. But when you feel empowered, 
you can say, wait a second, this is my truth we're talking about. You may have a different one, you know, but this is mine. And the whole gaslighting stuff doesn't run so easily when you feel worthy and empowered. Some part of your natural picker, when you've got it in your bones, says, this doesn't feel worthy. This doesn't feel empowering. This doesn't feel cherishing. And when you have them running, because mm -hmm. this is your natural GPS, then when you get those other feelings from a narcissist, the red lights go off beside your head, having to go through a whole list. Does this look like narcissistic personality disorder? Oh, what does DSM-6 say? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, there's an easier GPS and it can, and you can get your brain safe to have it again. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about like releasing the pain of past relationships, which like the subtitle is there, we're yes. not talking about that last narcissist, are we? Are we talking about going deeper to, to find the hurt that might have caused you to be with the narcissist? No, we are definitely looking for what I call the original imprints mm -hmm. that, you know, that was there. Okay. You know, being with a borderline personality disorder for a mom, you know, it, it took away a right to feel empowered. Mm. And it took away a right to have, to assert, which I now have. But for the longest time, I couldn't understand why I tended to get dominated in a relationship, <laughs> right? Mm. And if you have it, and narcissists are really good for that. So if you had that particular wound, some part goes, well, I don't have a right to feel disempowered. And you'll only choose what you have the rights for. That's, mm -hmm. I talk about these six rights and that you have that makes secure attachment. And when you have a right for more, some part goes, no, we don't deal with flying monkeys. We don't <laughs> deal with it. The, and, and you'll spot it when you're, you know, when you're being gaslighted or you're getting that honeymoon period, you know, you know, the, the love bombing stage. Yeah. And some part goes, this doesn't quite feel like cherishing. This feels like something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And again, you know, the, the difference between, you know, cherishing and um, sort of feeling wanted or, or you know, desired. I, I, I made a meme this weekend and I was like, desire is not the same thing as someone that really loves you. Like, ooh, you know, they're, they're even the spark, like a lot of people be like, there's no spark or we have the spark. The spark isn't real, right? <laughs> The spark is mostly, there's got to be chemistry. That's mostly reptilian brain. Most attraction comes from the caudate nucleus in your reptilian brain. Mm -hmm. I mean, reptiles aren't known for a whole lot of bonding. It's, <laughs> you know, they're, they're there for, you know, the whole thing about foraging and the other F word, right? <laughs> you, know, you know, that whole thing. But it, we have mammal brains on top of that. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the dopamine rush, which we all get, you know, it's not a true indicator. It's necessary. I mean, you can't have a long lasting love if you're not attracted to each other, mm -hmm. but it, it, it is no predictor of lasting by any means. Okay. Well, that's good to know for people who are you looking. You can't have it without it. You wouldn't, I mean, nobody wants a, a, a spouse that doesn't think they're attractive. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, on the other hand, it is, it is not the heart of, of, of bonding. Uh, you want to, you could have, I mean, the world is full of people who look hot or have been attracted to hot people. And then a month or two later, they're complaining because they don't feel worthy or welcomed or cherished or something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, that's the difference, I think, true with the narcissist. And, you know, if people have been in, involved in repeated relationships with them, you know, there's something to look at. I know a lot of friends are like, I have a broken picker. I don't trust myself. I'll pick another one. Um, what do you say about broken pickers? If someone says they're having a broken picker, I've had clients say that too. What we're talking about is a picker that was attuned for a time when it had to choose the best deal available. Mm -hmm. No brain gives up one of these four feelings of secure love or these rights. No brain gets up in the morning and says, how can I screw with my master? No mm -hmm. brain does that. It will choose the best deal available. Like an animal that will, what will chew its leg off if it's caught in a bear trap. Mm -hmm. Best deal available, mm -hmm. right? Nobody, but our brains, we, brains get habituated. So it's not a broken, it's elegantly 
working to keep you safe, but probably safe 40 years ago or 30 years ago when it's a six or seven year old. So we want to honor that part, not make it wrong. It is working hard. It's a loyal picker, just loyal to a time and it needs an update. Saying it's broken is like saying we're broken. What if that part were really, really super resourceful? The part of me that chose distance as a way of proving safe, being safe, worked elegantly when I was four dealing with a mother that could throw you against a wall. Mm -hmm. Not so good when I'm doing my little scholarly thing and my first wife says I'm lonely and I got out on her to get it. Mm -hmm. See, that point. So it's not broken. It's just working hard. It's loyal to keep you safe from a time that's no longer now. So if we see it that way, what we want to do, we want to honor that part, that mm -hmm. picture. We just want to update it and get it to work hard in a different direction. Now, how do we update it? Well, updating is, you know, there's a lot. I mean, I've been a trained therapist and, you know, and all that stuff. So the shorthand, and I don't try all the, is we have to go back and find the moment or close to there, you know. Uh, when the little one in the brain said, this having using having a voice or reaching out for my needs or feeling a part of a we it didn't feel safe or it, it wasn't there or it wasn't or it simply wasn't available mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> a mother who's been in a car accident and can't respond uh it, it will will give a a, a a missing right the same way as a borderline or narcissistic because she's not there and there's nothing wrong she was in a car accident for 10 months <laughs> You know, I was in traction and they can't meet needs. There's nothing wrong. I mean, I've seen that too. Uh, you know, sometimes people come by it naturally. And we want to make sure we find the exact flavor of safety mm. that was attached. For instance, if someone doesn't have a right to create a we, they don't, they have more right to be a me than in a we. Okay. Someone who is, who is trying to make sure they're not getting bounced against walls. Okay, that's one reason why you'd not want to be a we. Another one could be if you have, say, an enmeshed parent who's always six inches from your face, always invading you. That's a very different form of safety. Both will not want to be a part of a we. <clears throat> Both will feel I need to be a me. Mm -hmm. But if but you've got to know the exact flavor of safety. Mm -hmm. Once you and then and then there's various techniques for going back and helping the brain refine and add that feeling back into the menu, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the brain will then take the, it will take, it's this part of the brain that we're working back. It's not the part that says, hi, I'm Tracy. I wrote a book on narcissists and I just has a big story. It's this part back here and it's not sophisticated enough not to take a better deal. Right, right. You know, once, once you give it a better deal, what my clients was often say is five or six days later, I'm thinking and doing things differently and I'm not thinking about it. <clears throat> That's what happens when the difference between working with coaching just on a prefrontal cortex and working with these feelings way back here. <clears throat> yeah. And, and what I find with my clients and friends even is uh, as we talk about this broken picker and, and repeating the patterns is what a broken picker means is means you're doing the same stuff over and over and getting the same results and going, why didn't it work? Right. So I have friends and, and again, clients I have one friend that uh, she has been on over 2000 dates and she had such a long like Santa's list. He had to make one dollar more than her. He had to be this. He had to be this tall. He had to have this kind of job, this kind of income, this kind of thing. And, and never in this entire list of all of the things she needed, she could ascertain in five minutes of a date, he's out and and walk away from a date. And I was just like, but you didn't give him a chance. You know, there's, there's like, you don't really know the person because you're looking for these very superficial things. Never did she think about how I want this person to feel, make me feel, or how I want to feel cherished and loved and all of those things. So could the broken picker be associated with this sort of laundry list of dumb things? Well, there's two things. It could be that, you know, there's some part of her who is crafting ways they're all wrong so that she maybe doesn't really feel safe being in a we. There's always a way, there's always a strategy how you protect that wound. 
mm -hmm. you know, or, or on the other hand, I am convinced that sometimes more and more coaching where you can have everything you want. And these lists get longer and longer of people that come to me. It's a form of creating grandiosity. Mm. You know, uh, narcissism been on the rise. I mean, you know, I, 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 I had another love coach contact me and say, I've got a client that had, has a list of 350 things <clears throat> she wants from Emma. God. 350 <clears throat> and and she was how do you do it and i thought about it for about an hour and i said have her take the list <clears throat> and write out everything she needs to be to attract a man like that and after she gets to about 75 ask her how she feels mm -hmm. because it's going to be and then point out to her if she doesn't feel very worthy at at number 75 neither will he and the worthy ones will take off and leave, leaving her with the ones that don't feel worthy and then can't meet her. And then she wonders why she can't find what she's looking for. Mm -hmm. Because the secure ones don't want to deal with that. That's not love. That's a kid in a candy store. Mm -hmm. None of us, and nobody will ever have a spouse that is everything that they have ever went on their little Christmas list. Mm -hmm. it, that's not love. Love is something where we do know, well, I, you know, I get most of what I want. And we love the, and it, but if they're only there to meet our needs, there's something to, a little narcissistic about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and it's about time that we realize, you know, if all these things we we want, they want to want, they're going to want back mm -hmm. if they're secure. Right. So and it, there's a certain growth to just where's the right to to truly love and be loved for all of you. Mm -hmm. It gets a little too, it's a little too conditional. Love has conditions. I don't believe in unconditional love. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this is taking it to an extreme. And I think, um, you know, it's a whole paradox of choice. Barry Schwartz talked about mm -hmm. too many choices. People are more and more, the research shows, when you have too many choices available, you're not ever happy with the ones you can make. That's a bad deal for love. Absolutely. And I, I think... For me, I am always looking for those words to go, you know, like you have worthy, cherished, empowered, welcomed with joy. I always say, are they accountable? Are they honest, trustworthy? Um, are they reliable? Because if you have those as your standards, you're not going to hook up with a narc because they're not going to be accountable. They're not going to be responsible or honest. All those lies that you, you know, let pass for five years are suddenly going to become a, a giant elephant in the room, right? So having that honesty as the base, like if I don't see honest, I'm out. They have to have standards for something deeper than the superficial want list, if you would. Well, I would argue that accountability is a form of cherishing and protecting. Mm. One of my favorite quotes, a narcissist is one who seeks freedom without responsibility. Mm. What is, you know, but accountability is cherishing. Accountability is, you know, if I tell you, baby, that, you know, I'm going to be there at a certain time to pick you up, I will be there. I cherish you. That's a really good point at time. That's cherishing. Uh, cherishing doesn't. And the thing about cherishing, real cherishing, you don't need a lot of motivation to be accountable. Yes. Accountable is what you, is a lot of times what you give clients that don't feel worthy enough and they don't want to do their own their own program right but when when you naturally cherish somebody you're naturally there let me give me where cherishing comes from there was a uh, an experiment done with children who had attachment objects you know little blankets and bears that they you know you the likes of which if if you you don't they don't have them they don't go to sleep right my son had one he threw the bear into the Bart trained when he was two, and all I knew his mother said to me is, is you're going down there and getting it. <laughs> he goes, I can't put him to sleep tonight. And she was not unserious about it. Mm -hmm. I had to walk down there with a Bart person <laughs> and get it. Right. Now they they pull these these four-year-olds into a room who are very attached to an object. And the ones that were attached but not that attached, uh, oh, they had this big machine with a cleverly designed scientists in it uh, to see if they could replicate it that would fool the child and the ones that said yeah attached but not that attached they'd say 
Yeah, you can replicate that bear. Go ahead and do it. I want another blanket, right? But the ones that were super attached said, no, 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 no. Mm -mm, you can't find another Mr. Bear like that. There's no other Mr. Bears. When you are really attached, mm -hmm. you really love somebody. There is an essence to that that you can't get elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, when there's an essence that you fall in love with, just the way they giggle or the way they, they, they you know, they sing in the shower, the way they laugh, that essence, one, it gets you out of this, this long list of what you, you, there's something there that's more than a list. And it, and you naturally want to cherish and protect that. Mm -hmm. Accountability is the low end of, of cherishing. Right. Now it's a beginning. It's a beginning. It's a beginning. Yeah. But yeah. notice that in, in secure love, it's cherishing so much that the accountability comes natural. Mm -hmm. And I, and I would, and if, and I like accountability, mm -hmm. I like it because I'm a creature of duty myself. Uh, you want someone that's like that child that says, oh, no, no, there's no one that wouldn't like him or her. And they are naturally going to protect that. Right, right. In a way, you know, cherishing, people think cherishing is putting you on a pedestal. But is it more than that? Uh, see, you put it on a pedestal. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't like do, that. I don't like I, that. No, no, no. I mean, it's, I, that's why I don't go for king and queen language either. Yeah. because it gets in no you see there's too much dynamics i work with couples too going one up and one down right and the, for the one up person it works they don't want to come down one down for the one down oh yeah empower me right mm -hmm. but then a lot of times when they're one down when they get up there they go oh i want to go one up too and you then you see what you know um but i don't like this it's health is in the middle right exactly yeah. and to me putting anyone on a pedestal is is it's you know, I, I get the cherish idea, but the pedestal idea really rings narc to me. Yes. My narc was like, put me on a pedestal. It was all that love bombing crap and it wasn't real. So to me, cherish would be like a flag to me. Not the way you're talking about cherish, but that putting you on a pedestal way to me would be red flag because of the narc. Yeah, the way they put you on, a narcissist puts you on a pedestal is a way to manipulate you because they'll threaten to take it away. And they want to give you a nice, good supply of it, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, no, this is way more, it's cherishing is to hold dear, mon chéri, my dear, in uh, French, right? Mm -hmm. It is to hold dear. And I don't think to hold dear is about putting on a pedestal. Yeah, no, I don't agree either. I, yeah. I, think, I think that is why I brought it up because I was just like, I want to clarify and have you clarify because again that fear of the love bombed you know person who has been through this kind of relationship that felt they were cherished and then poof one day you weren't and that's not real cherish cherish is forever in a day remember that David Cassidy song maybe it wasn't David Cassidy cherish is the one that one <laughs> Yeah. No, you know, the narcissist needs to have a hit to their ego. They exalt you because some part of them needs to feel they're with a superior creature, right? In order for them to feel validated. Right. It's a reflection of the, the real love bombing is a reflection of their own poor self-esteem. Mm -hmm. right. And of course, when you're on that pedestal, see the right to love and be loved, you get to, you know, what I talk, the real narcissistic wounds I talk about in the book is they don't have a right to, to create their own experience. That means they can't be um, good and bad, strong and weak. And when you get put up on that pedestal, you can't be fully human. I mean, my idea of what a full right to create your experience is, is you can be all the aspects of humanity. Or as I got off, I put it in the book, I got it off a dove bar in the 90s. It was one of those little sayings in the middle of the dove bar. It says, you can, it's okay to be flawed and fabulous. It's the flaw part. What happens when you show up as your normal human self? You have a bad moment. They can't deal with that. That's not love. Love is when you know you can have a bad day, but the two of you have gotten so good in a good relationship at knowing about real repair, which narcissists never know how to do, mm -hmm. right? That you know you'll get beyond it, that you can have a bad day. Loving partners, the real research points out, they have what's called you know, a, a positive a filter for each other okay uh they call it positive sentimental override in the literature but 
That all that means is, gosh, it looks like Tracy's having a bad day today. I wonder what's going on with her, right? For the narcissist, that doesn't hold too long, right? Because they need you to be perfect. So you reflect well on them. And once you get that stuff going, uh, you'll never feel like you can come off and be loved again. Mm -hmm. the, the, it becomes lonely up there on that pedestal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more like the monkey at the, at the, at the circus. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's why people need to really understand the difference between the love that they have had before and not going after that again. Again, I started with the credentials of what people are looking for and going, you know, while those might be something that would be nice, again, what about like the forgiveness for them snoring or, you know, like there, there's no real love there. The person has to not snore or they can't come in your house. Right. I mean, that to me is like, all right, well, I get it, but it's just going to create the same kind of situation that they've had before. Yeah. No, real life couples say snoring. Snoring happens. I hate saying it, it happens. Right. One couple secure they what they notice is the snoring was interrupting each other's uh, patterns so much of sleep that they were getting irritated and arguing more. But she was a real cuddler. So they realized for the sake of their marriage, they needed to have a separate bedroom so they would have better sleep and they could be more calm. Perfect. And what they came up with the solution was 20 minutes beforehand she, she go to bed and cuddle for 20 minutes get up go to bed get up 20 minutes before you get up go cuddle nice. this is real life real repair you know mm -hmm. this is what love is mm -hmm. in narcissists you're always there to reflect well and you know my favorite title from a book is on narcissism i forgot who it was that did it it's the object of my affection is in my reflection mm -hmm. the title is that's a great book on narcissism uh, and the title is just says it all. So, you know, how worthy do you feel? When you pick that up, how worthy do you feel? Mm -hmm. How cherished? How empowered? This is, you know, the, the, your, your, your attachment system, as I'm saying in my book, is simpler. It's these love styles, our attachment styles, are, are established by the time you're one years old, one to one and a half. That, that brain isn't doing a lot of thinking. It's not doing a lot of analyzing. It's not doing story or beliefs. It's only running feelings. If we can restore the natural GPS, which is nothing but feelings, and particularly these four feelings, as I argue, you know, welcomed, worthy, cherished, and empowered, and you understand what those mean, and you can feel them, then the other, when someone presents you something else, it, it bounces off. Mm -hmm. um, the story I tell is back when counterfeiting wasn't a science like it is now. In the 60s, the FBI had a counterfeit program. And how do they train people to recognize counterfeit? Would you think they had all, I, I once looked at, there's like 20 different things you can look at in a long list. It's not what they did. They brought people into a room for a week. And for the first four days, all they did was feel money, hand money for eight hours every day. Wow. And around noon on the Friday, they started slipping through the, the fake bills. And they immediately, from having an accustomed knowing what, it, what real money felt like, they automatically recognized the fake bill. Mm -hmm. So it's, part, it's good to have the coach and to know what the fake stuff looks like. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's really good to have when you really have a feel. Mm -hmm. for what real love is yeah. and it is a feeling state and my own progress in life, especially as a man who was told you can't have your feelings i swear to god i didn't think it would be feelings that would be the key when i started off that'd be something more logical than that right tracy <laughs> <laughs> a man thing yep <laughs> <laughs> turned out oh no no the first time i realized it was four feelings i looked up to the universe and said now i know you're a woman <laughs> but it's it's progressively it, allowing our gut mm -hmm. and our heart to register these feelings because they're not going to lie to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, awesome. And so that we're looking for welcomed and worthy and cherished and empowered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that works. And then you'll automatically 
you'll feel the narcissist way clear. It doesn't mean that they may not fool you for a little bit, but mm -hmm. some of them are really good. Really? But you'll you'll spot it a much easier. Yeah. yeah. And I have this this thing that I, I made for my, my support group ladies. One girl was like, so how many strikes do they get? Like one strike, they're out. Two strikes, they're out. And I was like, like, it, it's not like four lies and you're out. It's it you lied. You didn't show up. You didn't do this. You weren't responsible. Like there's a lot of different things. So it, it it's exactly. your own judgment. But it's what is it that is not acceptable is what you've got to have laid out before you go into this. Like that way, you know, hey, they just lied to me three times. I'm done. Right. You have to have the, the self-trust to walk away when they've lied to you three times and go, that's it. I'm done. They have to know what they don't want in order to get what they want. Exactly. And and if someone's lying to you, your gut should be saying, how come I trust this? Mm -hmm. You know, because trust is a track record. Mm -hmm. If someone lies, uh, you know, yeah, that seems to me, once someone has lied a few times, I'm done. I'm not talking the little li white lies where you lie about, did you get something from me for Christmas? No. Mm -hmm. Is it in the closet? No. <laughs> I'm not talking about that stuff, right? Um, those are the sort of things that when, you, just check in with your feelings when someone's lied. If you're living, what's the feeling in your gut? It's like, what is the feeling? Is it disempowered? Mm -hmm. Which can be some time. Mm -hmm. or it can be just not worthy mm -hmm. you know um that's not it's about seeking someone who can be a life partner that we can trust mm -hmm. absolutely you know? and narcissism um you know they you know they did a study where they pointed out they asked people or they did a survey would you rather get a physical beating like you would with a borderline or would you rather have um a narcissist you know doing a, a mind uh, fracking with you, so to speak, right? And most people choose the physical beating over the the mental torture yeah. because it, it's. I I personally think, having dealt with a couple of, uh, uh, I've had one in particular that got past me earlier on in my life. Um, oh, the mind messing with you is worse. I think oh, yeah. because it gets you to doubt yourself, turns you inside out, right? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I think it's worse. I think it's worse. It is. I was, I was with a, um, I was, went to the DA's office in uh, Boulder last week to talk with the head of the new DV task force. And um, I'm going to be helping them in some way. And she said the exact same thing. She was like, when we're facing and we're dealing with these victims, I, you know, the emotional versus the physical, they tick physical over it because those feel like they, they, they heal, but the emotional is what destroys their soul and, and makes them lose themselves. And so most of them also pick, you know, which one do you want? No, you know, they would rather take the physical because the emotional is just torture and it's the gift that keeps on giving it never, um, you know, you're just trapped in this loop until you get out of it. Yeah. And it's important to have enough rights where you have these feelings inside you that you do not choose mm -hmm. uh, abuse like that. Right. You know, um, that's the real thing. You know, knowing that you you were born, if you're listening to this, you were born to feel worthy. You were born to feel empowered. You were born to feel church. You had to be taught how to feel unworthy. Mm -hmm. But it can be reclaimed. Your brain knows that. Your brain comes out. What baby, you know, comes out and refuses to, to, to nurse? They don't. You know, sometimes, you know, I know, I know there can be some uh, problems at times when sometimes babies can't find what they're looking for, but they can, little HE league has got a lot. Of, it takes a few days and you're over that stuff, right? There's a natural instinct there. They don't come thinking, I better not, I better not receive anything. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not how we come out of the womb. Right. right. We had to be taught and we can recover it. Uh, my own life says that lots of clients, but most of all, you know, you wouldn't be here listening to this podcast is some part didn't know you were worthy of more right and it's believing and moving away from the fear that you're not worthy um what is the most important thing in your book that people are going to learn to help them feel safe what's the key big thing boom 
you know, gosh, there's so much in there. It's, I think the biggest thing is your brain just took the best deal available. Stop judging yourself. And then it's all adjustable. Your brain will reclaim these rights. Mm -hmm. Now, it does a lot about showing how these feelings become predictable patterns in relationships, predictable problems. People say it's eye-opening. But the real thing is what most people get out of it is, my God, I've got a right, a natural right to have love, to feel worthy. That people come away feeling worthy and empowered and hopeful. And there's a roadmap to making it real. Because, you know, I'm done with people, you know, I don't like hope structures where you have more of a right to hope for love than to have love. Mm -hmm. This is about having a right to fully have love. Mm -hmm. I'm believing it. And it's that. doable change. And uh, yeah, and you can learn to trust yourself, to love yourself. I never tell someone to love themselves. Mm -hmm. if you teach them or you teach them but if you not teaching that's the wrong word but if you allow if you can do the deep work so they feel welcomed and worthy and cherished and empowered you don't have to tell them to love themselves they do it naturally right. that's what loving yourself is and uh, then you realize you deserve someone who gives them back mm -hmm. and you're not going to settle for less <laughs> exactly settling is always unworthy it might be a little disempowered sometimes. When you have those feelings, you know that uh, the, the narcissist will start bouncing off you. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. of the vulnerability. You know, settling is, is a, a vulnerability that, that they love. They're like, oh, yeah, I can work with that. You know, they know exactly how you feel inside and they take and manipulate everything about it. So, yeah. And, and if you're feeling it sooner and quicker, then you're, this part can do all sorts of mental, but he's a lawyer. He's a doctor. I've seen that stuff. Well, yeah, he is, you know, <laughs> you know, but it's like, you know, but when you're going with the feelings, that stuff that tends to lie about the potentiality, that's called the list, it goes away. It doesn't mean that, you know, we don't have some things, but it should be a short list, four or five things you really need, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, you know, again, I'll go back to some of the lists that people have. And it's like, well, I ski, so they've got to ski. Well, no, they can do that and you can still ski. Like, you don't have to give up what you want. That's what people miss, you know, misinterpret when they're making this list is if they don't ski, then I don't want them because I like to ski. But then you say, well, how often do you ski? Well, I like to go once a year. So, you know, could you go by yourself? Like, why does that part have to disclaim everything else that was right about this person? Well, online programs are all about compatibility lists. And now there's research. Compatibility on things like that is, a, it's not only a non-predictor, it actually predicts more of a breakup. Mm -hmm. Because, because if, this is not, what 70% of all couples say is, is is the heart of a, of a really good marriage is the quality of the marital friendship. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, compatible, most people say, well, we weren't compatible. We didn't have the values. No, no, the people can have all of that. But if the quality of the, of the what's called the marital friendship or the partnership friendship is clear, you can negotiate that. Mm -hmm. There's mistaking compatibility for attachment, real attachment and real skills. And those things that dating apps are giving us, they're, they're non sequiturs. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't predict anything other than heartache. People use compatibility as a way of, of glossing over the fact that these, they just weren't good for each other in terms of really being each other's best friends. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, my favorite uh, definition of, of marriage or you or partnership, if you want to use that word that I got from Julie Gottman, it's, 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 you know, she said, somebody asked her how to define marriage. She says, oh, that's easy. It's friendship with nudity. Mm -hmm. Friendship. <laughs> yeah. You know, where you really love being with each other. You're talking, you got each other's back. You're each other's best friends. This mm -hmm. is what real love is. And then the nudity is a beautiful, uh, you know, side benefit. <laughs> Hopefully not just all on the side. You know, it can't be at the center if you really want it. That's a full right to love and be loved. I talk about that. It's not just you know, passion or partnership, it's both. Yeah. It's both. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, and if you're out there, you deserve the passion and the partnership, a real we. 
And even if a narcissist talks about a we, it's going to come in in a very skewed way about their own needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You need a we that's got your back, not you just having theirs. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. I should make a meme for that. That was awesome. <laughs> um, uh, so can you tell everybody how they can reach you and find out more about you besides finding your book, Safe to Love Again, on Amazon and anywhere else? How can they reach you? Well, you know, they can go to my website, GarySalyer.com, S-A-L-Y-E-R.com. There's a way to reach me there, Dr. Gary at GarySalyer.com. Uh, you know, you can also sign up for, on the front page, my uh, uh, video series, My Guide for Lasting Love. You know, and you, and you can choose three different versions, a right to create your experience. One for singles aren't dating, singles who are dating can't find the one, and one for couples. So those are different ways of getting more in touch with my work, you know and uh, getting a hold of me. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I know that my community is going to be grasping at straws for this, going, I want it, I want it, I want it. So hopefully people are drawn to find your book. It's fascinating, and it is it is breaking the patterns of the things that you know we have done before. That's the only way to change it when you've been in repeated narcissist relationships. It's time to go what am I looking for? What am I selling for? What do I need? And is this person giving it to me or not? And just know you have, a, if you're out there listening, no matter, you know, I, my favorite line in the book is this, Tracy, this is my line. No event or person should have the, the power to control the rest of your incarnation. Mm. There came a day where someone said to me, Gary, your mother's dead. She's not doing it to you. No event, whether no matter how or, you know, a past relationship should have the power to dictate from our, and our brain gets all sorts of fear patterns. That's given them too much. You have the right to create your own experience. And that means to recreate your reality. That means to be able to, to reach for what you've never reached before, to know that you can create a way that you've never had before, to boldly go where you've never gone before <laughs> to use a little star trek and yes i'm a trek <laughs> but you have that right don't let a narcissist through the kind of ghost in the closet control you do not let all the ways you defend against them keep you from you know attract to some else because the defenses will be walls for other people mm -hmm. clear it's release the past pain and then create the love. What was it? You deserve. First release it, then wreak, then, and then create the love you deserve. You have a birthright for this. Don't let them get, don't let you, don't let them keep. Learn your lessons and move on. Mm -hmm. And find what you want. This is my lesson. It's an empowering. It's about releasing past pain, not mm -hmm. holding on. Learning your lessons, yes. Oh, yes. And then learning and uh, opening your heart in a way that um, you and they will feel loved. Yeah, perfect. What a wonderful way to close this. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Tracy. Wasn't that great? I just loved his information. And we could have talked all day. Actually, after the, the interview, we talked for a long time. And um, feeling safe to love again is something that you need to work on. Get his book. If you're in this position where you are ready, but you just don't feel like you can do it right this time, get his book and see what kind of patterns you've had. And as I discussed with the dating thing, what your expectations are so that we move the dial. If we're expecting them to be six foot one and make one dollar more than you, um, is that all that we need? Or do we need to look inside at how they make us feel? Do they feel, make us feel cherished and loved? That's what we want. So get to it. Go find his book. I'll put the link below. And thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel and you'll be notified when I make another video. So again, Tracy Malone, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Thank you all so much. And I'll see you again soon.